Uh, my question is for uh, Frank. Uh, what is, when you give that talk in the Netherlands, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the reaction in general? Well, uh, thank you for your question. Um, well, like I said in my speech, I mean, I say the most un-PC things, and people haven't got angry at me. And um, only one person has uh, called me a racist once uh, after a very modest article in the newspaper, and that was it. So uh, apparently my arguments are pretty good, and I haven't uh, been a non-person yet. So. But uh, if I um, would gather more publicity, uh, they would know how to find me, I think. You know, they would uh, uh, denounce me and stuff. So, but up till now, it's been okay. And the responses are also of relief. Like, as, uh, you know, first, many people feel that there's something wrong with the egalitarian anti-discrimination movement and ideology, but they can not pin it down. And so the book, that's why I like the book, because and why I decided to write it, because in, in 100 pages, you're forever inoculated against egalitarianism. And you have your ammunition in your discussions with people who call you a racist or a sexist or etc. So um, there is a response of relief, but the audiences have mostly been uh, liberty-minded or uh, center, uh, right of center. Uh, they no, they they, uh, they don't want to invite me. <laughs> no, it's it's amazing. I mean, I say the most outrageous things, and uh, that would be you know whenever I talk, people are very talkative about it. They they really like to discuss these things, which you would expect from university to welcome, and uh, but no, they talk about um, um, very uh, unimportant things. I think often. Um, I have a question concerning the relation between Switzerland, Switzerland Liechtenstein, but let's say Switzerland and Austria, which is, as we heard, very, very thoroughly friendly. Um, nevertheless, there are, um, we talked about that, um, Schweizer Witze <laughs> jokes about Swiss. Uh, of course, there are many Austrian <laughs> jokes jokes about Austrians in Switzerland. Um, generally, I would say also that there is a very good and friendly relationship, but maybe one point quite important uh, within these historical contexts, you, you mentioned that um, after World War, World War I, when there was this vote in Vorarlberg, um, whether they would like to come to Switzerland, the vote was tremendously for this change, but nevertheless it did not take place among others because of Switzerland that feared that too many Catholics come uh, into Switzerland and change uh, uh, the, that order that was in Switzerland. Could you comment on that aspect too? Yeah, my comment is that uh, my speech was uh, just related to the uh, to the position the Austrians have against their uh, to their neighboring states, and this may be mistakenly uh, heard. Uh, I know that there are some uh, discriminating ideas from the Swiss Swiss side to Austrians, so I, I just meant the Austrian view of the Swiss Swiss and the Liechtenstein people. Um, I wanted to add uh, a point of view from the Katzelmachers, the <laughs> Italians. Um, it's just a, a reflection about what you said. In Italy, we have a distinct difference between the regions where the Austrians ruled, uh, Lombardia, Veneto, Friuli, and even Toscana, which have a tradition of good administration, even with the mess of the Italian states, whereas the rest of Italy is more like disorderly Mediterranean, as you would expect. And so, uh, just uh, um, to, to reflect about this, the Austrian Empire left a very good impression, even on the countries which fought the Austrian Empire bitterly, like Italy, which uh, was built in the fight against Austria. And so I would like to hear your comment on, on this. Yeah, I have nothing to, uh, to say uh, to, 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 uh, to um, contradict what you said. Uh, I just want to add um, this, uh, this term, Katzelmacher, is a thing from 
centuries, not centuries, from, from decades ago. So the modern Austrians do not even know the bird. So it's my generation and, uh, and the older ones who have some, um, some ideas of the times when the Italians changed the side and they began the war on our side and they ended it on the other side two times. <laughs> and uh, th therefore this um, pejorative word uh, stems from, but nowadays this is this, uh, this absolutely died out. May I add about the word Katzelmacher because it's uh, sometimes misunderstood. It has nothing to do with cat, yeah? making cats, but it means making kettles. Yeah, because there were people, particularly from, from the region of Friuli, uh, who went uh, uh, to Vienna and they sold the kettle to people who, to, who were specialized on that. And from this kettle maker, it came out Katzelmacher. I think it's not just in Italy, it's almost everywhere. The uh, difference is still visible, interestingly, in, of course, the architectural patterns of the city, but then seemingly this tradition of better administration. Uh, but I think mostly it's just, it was the border between Western Europe and Eastern Europe that followed it, so there are many other reasons for differences. And uh, the administration seems to have been quite efficient because at the time it was kind of mandarin system where they really tried to attract an elite uh, uh, to the public service. Uh, uh, so um, it was for example uh, Böhm Bawerk who uh, instituted uh, uh, direct income taxation uh, and he did so with an amazingly small number of uh, public employees so they were really orderly and efficient uh, unfortunately that wasn't uh, such a good precedence uh, to do so but uh, also it explains a bit uh, as long as the Austrian economists were part of the establishment they thought that the minimal state is possible because they saw the potential of having a small elite with a very high uh, uh, how do you say that the, the, the pathos uh, and, and the ethos uh, of uh, the administrators? So they really, or many of them, thought it was a privilege to be a servant uh, for the public. Uh, and uh, I think that may explain some of the better administration. But I, I think the main reasons are more cultural and more Western uh, European. Uh, I grew up in South Africa, so naturally the whole topic of discrimination was always very present. And uh, when I left more than 20 years ago, uh, we often had discussions about this. So anyway, about 15 years ago, I then, in thinking about this topic, realized that, similar to what you said, discrimination is a fundamental requirement of life. If I choose food instead of poison, I'm discriminating. And every living action, every single living action is an act of discrimination. So if you forbid discrimination, you're actually forbidding life. The interesting thing is then I realized, wow, okay, so that means if I forbid the government from discriminating, you're effectively forbidding government from taking actions. So I then des designed a constitution that forbids the government only, but not private individuals from discriminating. Therefore, you would be limiting government, but still leaving room for... That's a, so it's another... Um, uh, to go into details is, isn't the right place here, but uh, it's kind of funny that one can turn it around on its head. All right, well, thank you for your uh, compliments for the talk. Um, yes, I didn't go into government discrimination, and it's easy to say for libertarians, well, governments shouldn't discriminate, but the, the Dutch government does discriminate regarding uh, national holidays for you know, that are Christian. So, in a way, they they're they do enact uh, religious discrimination, which is which was fine anyway, because 99% of the population was. Uh, another thing is what they do, of course, with combating crime is just to discriminate. And when they uh, try to prevent uh, people from having car accidents, they target young men. So it is uh, very difficult not to discriminate, even for a government. Uh, but to discriminate in a the, in the way that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Jim Crow laws, where they would say to uh, bus companies, you know, the, the, uh, the blacks and whites should be separate. That is very immoral, I think. And, uh, and the funny thing is also that, or the remarkable thing is that anti-discrimination laws are actually uh, similar to discrimination laws, because in both situations, the government tells us whom to associate with. So it's the other side of the same coin 
namely coercion. Um, did I uh, answer your question well or respond to it? Thank you. We can talk about it later on. And that applies to everyone. So, uh, what was your view on Bavarian? Bavarian. Bavarian. Yes. Um, so, uh, do you think Austrians would be more friendly to Bavarian versus the German German? Uh, well, because I'm I'm asking this because whether religion comes into play because. Uh, I believe Bavaria is mostly Catholic, and the rest of Germany might be Protestant, so yes. Yes, as I have said, most Austrians are Bavarianized uh, Slavs, so uh, they are quite close, apart from Vorarlberg, uh, which are Alemannic, so it's a different uh, Germanic tribe, so that may be the reason why Vorarlberg uh, found more attachment to the Alemannic Switzerland and uh, Liechtenstein. Uh, uh, so, of course, there's a cultural closeness, which is obvious uh, uh, between Bavaria and large parts of Austria. Uh, but I mean, there's no talk nowadays of joining Bavaria, of creating a big Bavaria. I've never read or heard about anything. And I think it goes back to Napoleon, uh, the, the big uh, I mean, change difference between Bavaria and, and Austria. Uh, so it's, it's not a topic of today, it's just a cultural closeness. Uh, but then you see the closeness um, differently in, in the Slovenians in the south at the same music and, and way of dressing. So it's very close to the Alpine cultures, which are German-speaking. Uh, so it's more this Alpine and rather Catholic uh, identity. The difference between the northern Germans and the southern uh, southern Germans, the, uh, the Bavarians in special, uh, go, dates also back to the German war I mentioned in my speech, uh, when the Bavarians fought on the Austrian side and lost against the, uh, the Prussians uh, and, uh, well, that may be an uh, explanation for the um, resentiments, resentiments uh, of, the, of the Bavarians against the northern Germans. Um, also to Carl, it seems to me that, that if um, the PC Brigade and the anti-discrimination movement were consistent in their thinking, they would be very much in favor of the free market because there is no more relentless enemy of irrational prejudice than the free market. Um, a, a, a sexist employer who chooses to pay a man 40% more than a woman simply because he doesn't want to employ women or promote women would get a 40% a smack on his bottom line which would soon sort out his, uh, his prejudices. Yet all of them, uh, all of the PCB grade are fanatically anti-market. Have we as libertarians failed to convey the message that in fact the most egalitarian, most anti-discriminate, anti-prejudice institution that you could have is a free market if it were allowed to operate. Uh, you mentioned you're from South Africa. Strangely enough, one of the most effective apartheid um, laws was not the color bar laws which discriminated on color. It was the law which demanded the rate for the job. So you had to pay the same amount to a white man as to a black man. Who would you choose, a white man who speaks English or Afrikaans, or and who comes from a city and is acculturated, or a black man who's just come from the village and, and has no in, industrial experience, if you had to pay the same amount? There's no awareness of the fact that uh, the free market allows the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the disadvantaged, disadvantaged to discount their, their disabilities and to uh, osmose into the, free and, uh, into, the, into the mainstream and undermine the very foundations of prejudice. I think if that is the message that we could get across, we'd get a better uh, understanding, hopefully, of what it means to be a libertarian. Yeah, quite true. Uh, thank you for your uh, question or your comment. Um, I didn't go into this uh, very much, but uh, many people have commented on the book that they say, well, the, that uh, many of these laws that don't seem to have anything to do, like you mentioned about equal pay, uh, are most uh, detrimental to, or, or you know, su su conducive to discrimination, uh, like the minimum wage law and equal pay. Because you know, feminism has this great reputation for me that they shoot themselves in the foot. Because if um, uh, if you want equal pay, of course, uh, and for any reason, good or bad or right or wrong, uh, a company owner would say, well, I don't want to employ women. 
then uh, and you have to and, and then the state demands that you pay them equally or sorry i don't want i want the, the company wants to pay them less uh, for any reason doesn't matter in this case but economics says that in that case he will uh, favor the, the, the man instead of, instead of the woman it, it is, you, make, you make it more easy for sexist <laughs> to be sexist and uh, I don't think we really failed in explaining this. Well, we could do a lot more, and the book tries to help with that. But uh, as with the PC brigade, these people want to be, uh, you know, they, they, they look at um, good intentions. They don't care about bad results. They want to feel good about themselves, I think, often, is often the case. I mean, uh, this is not always the case, but I think it's often the case. And you, in my discussions with them, I noticed that. And um, a friend of mine, he mentioned, um, you know, they, 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 they want to be world improvers. They want to have the status of world improvers, but they don't care about improving the world. <laughs> well, they care about preventing individual choice. They do care about results. They, they, they have a hidden agenda. The agenda yeah, yeah. Their agenda is to interfere with individual choice and individual freedom, which they disguise behind this good intentions yes. and application. Yeah, they very much have uh, are very much results oriented. Yeah, but different results than the good results they. It's hypocrisy. Okay. Yeah. Oh. It's a charade. It's the whole thing about good intentions. Charade. Well, that we have to call them out for their inco inconsistency of their arguments and their shameful, uh, shameless uh, hypocrisy and their virtue signaling. Um, I'm glad these words have become more common now because now we can use them more often against them. What's the, your opinion in Austria, the feeling about the AU? Do they want to have an exit as well, or do they voluntarily be brave and stay in the AU, or what is your opinion on this? <clears throat> I would exclude it um, from the background of, of Austrian history. And the background of Austrian history is a continuous changing from small to great to small to great and whatever so we happened it happened several times in our history and i think that the austrians fundamentally are very afraid uh, they felt themselves treated treated badly by history in the 20th century uh, it was very difficult for them to get out of the insinuation that they were all nazis they were only about would say a third of them were Nazis, which is, <laughs> would say, enough. But uh, then they got the status of the first victim of Nazi aggression at the conference in Moscow in 43. And afterwards, they built up their new identity. This is one side of the thing. The second side of the thing is that there is a strong anti-Austrian mood in the uh, Austrian left. Um, uh, remember what Andreas told about uh, the idea of the unification with Germany in the First Republic and the high degree of, of, of uh, let's say, of unity between social democrats and, uh, and, and national liberals or Nazis. No? So they all wanted to go to Germany. Uh, the only group where the Christian Social, uh, the, the Christian Social Party of Dolfus, uh, who uh, tried to continue this uh, legalistic, loyalistic tradition of the monarchy, the independence of Austria, the idea, the Austrian idea for Central Europe, which was revived also after uh, 45. And so you have fundamentally two groups. In the left, there is still a kind of hate against uh, the Republic of Austria, the idea of Austria itself, which you can see in this uh, incredible Europeanism. No? So we have to overcome this old traditional and Catholic and reactionary Austria in order to be modernized. And we, can, we cannot do it out of our own forces, but we, have to help, we need the help of the European Union. So there are very few people in, the Europe, uh, in, in Austria which would uh, uh, openly say that it would be much better for us to leave the European Union. I am among them, but... Uh, uh. Yeah, I think, I mean, Austria is uh, schizophrenic, it's a split uh, country. 
uh, we say Vienna is a kind of waterhead or overblown. It was the center of a huge monarchy now reduced to a little bit more than 10% of it, but retained uh, the size and the bureaucrats uh, uh, and so on. And then there's rural Austria and that's really split. And you can see the electoral results is like it boils down to binary uh, results and that will continue. So we have a polarized country. Uh, and at the moment, it's more than 50% uh, in favor of staying uh, with the status quo because, of course, everything else is quite risky. Uh, uh, but that may change uh, in the future, uh, and uh, that's, that's quite open. So I agree uh, that nobody actually, so not nobody, but um, just a small portion of the Austrians really would ch like uh, or prefer a dramatic change. So the, the, the Austrians are conservative from the from the onset and uh, they do not like changes at, at all. And now we are part of the European Union. Um, it was a clear vote. How long ago? 20 years ago, something like that. So it was a clear vote to, to enter the Union and um, I think it would be difficult to find a majority today to leave again. Uh, and uh, you have also to take into consideration that uh, the media to 100% is, uh, is propagandizing the, yeah, so the, you, you cannot really fight against uh, these forces successfully. Do you think the follow-up to that, now that the government realizes that it's not very effective, is quotas, particularly in the workplace, is that what is is that what's is causing those changes? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. What changes you were? Uh, the quotas in the workplace in some countries. Um, oh yes. Johan mentioned South Africa. That's a, that's an example where quotas are being implemented. We see it in Germany in the police force now. They're trying to um, trying to sort of. I not, think so. Not so direct, but indirect quotas in the in in government employment, and I'm sure it's happening I elsewhere mean, too. Yes, thank you for your question, uh, Aaron. Um, I do think indeed that they see that the previous policies uh, to get parity in the workplace uh, uh, didn't work. Actually, of course, they will not admit that it had a, a counterproductive effect, so they'll now come with the quotas. And they implement, interesting, I, I write about this in the book too, they tried it uh, in, what was it, Norway, uh, to have a 40% uh, minimum, 40% of board of directors needed to be female, uh, and uh, according to the Economist, 200 companies went off the stock market because it was only only applied to publicly traded companies. And of course, you have many other companies; they started having token positions. So uh, you can't fool nature, and. Uh, <laughs> So it will have a detrimental effect too. I mean, uh, it, it, it will also stigmatize women because of that. And uh, because, you know, due to weak, you need affirmative action, etc. And uh, another way, another side effect is that it stigmatizes women in the fact that um, if you have a certain position on your own merits, people will, and Thomas Sowell has uh, written on this and Walter Williams, but if you, uh, have you uh, rightly gained that position on your own merits, uh, people will look at you uh, not being certain whether you uh, are there or because of affirmative action. And suppose we would, I think Thomas Sowell gave that wonderful uh, example, I think, of uh, suppose the uh, one, Qantas Airlines or something, or British Airways has a policy of uh, affirmative action for pilots, uh, uh, for women or minorities. Uh, you know, people would be very scared to, or more scared to fly with them because they would know that uh, uh, the pilots would be uh, selected because of their characteristics and not their merits. So, uh, although I'm sure there are very many uh, eligible uh, uh, minority members or women that could do the job, but of course this, uh, this, has, this is an unintended uh, consequence. And uh, did I answer your question? Thank you. I want to make a funny addition. In uh, this country, freedom of discrimination fully exists. <laughs> so, <Good>. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's one of the advantages here. 
Certain, thing, certain things you can say here, which would you get, get you in, into deep trouble at, at other places, but there are other things that are problematic to say here. <laughs> well, I can comment on that, because uh, the first book, Beyond Democracy, was translated in 20 languages, and I thought about the, this book, The Discrimination Myth, but I thought, well, this is typically a Western uh, item, an issue. It doesn't, you know, in Thailand, they don't have this. So I don't think there will be a Thai edition or a Turkish edition. The question for the whole panel. Um, there were some comments just now, again, talking about the difference between urban voters and rural voters in Austria. But we see it everywhere. We see it in, in the United States, uh, the big uh, population centers versus so-called flyover country. Uh, we see it in the Brexit vote between London and non-London. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Vienna versus uh, the rest of Austria. Um, so we see it everywhere. And I'm curious if you think that there's a possibility of a split at some point, um, political split between big cities and rural areas, and how this could play out, what the dynamics, how that could look. A split like this is impossible along territorial lines, uh, and that's why it's not thought about, uh, thought about today. But actually, I think it's the more natural solution, and that would have been the only solution to keep alive the cultural realm of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, because you couldn't have split it along geographic lines. But obviously, the settlement uh, was very different in cities and in the countryside, and for example, in what is today Ukraine, and was then Galicia, Lemberg was a Polish city with German Jews, and the countryside was all Ruthenians, uh, which are now uh, called Ukrainians. Uh, so it's impossible to just carve out uh, a nation state, but it would have made sense to have cities as autonomous and uh, diverse uh, concentration points, like a harbor uh, or so on, or not, uh, uh, in, in, in the trade routes, uh, whereas you have the countryside which is organized along different lines and more homogeneous lines. Uh, uh, so I think that's the solution that out of history would make most sense, but it's so far from our current political thought that uh, uh, I don't see it as any feasible uh, solution to the problems. Uh. Because, I mean, carving out Vienna out of Austria today along territorial lines uh, wouldn't make uh, any sense. You wouldn't want to uh, have a wall and, uh, uh, and no exchange. I mean, Vienna would die <laughs> uh, immediately without uh, having access to the trade routes and the countryside. So this idea of having autonomy but being open, uh, that's uh, very hard to grasp uh, at the moment. Uh, and that's why a lot of reaction towards the European Union and decentralization tends to shut down and uh, uh, that uh, I don't really like about these reactions and a lot of, of course, the countryside reaction against uh, the more urban, urban cosmopolite uh, uh, elites uh, is uh, a bit reactionary in a negative sense in that they think they just shut down and have their autonomous or even autarky uh, regions uh, and that, of course, uh, doesn't make sense. So it's a different way of thinking about politics, uh, which I hope uh, uh, will uh, will, I mean, remain as the only peaceful solution to cope with the polarization we're seeing at the moment. I think there is there are several dimensions of this uh, question. From the historical point of view, uh, it was a very uh, highly discussed uh, topic of the conferences in Saint-Germain in Versailles after the, after the First World War. So the question fundamentally was, uh, when the town has, is dominated by a certain nationality, should we take the town and then attach the surrounding uh, uh, regions and, and villages, or should the town be incorporated in the majority of the people outside? That's very, that was a very important question, for instance, in a, in a town like Fiume, nowadays Rijeka, which was mostly Italian, with Hungarians living there and Germans also, and, and uh, 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 circundated by a Croat population, or the same thing with Slovenes in Trieste. 
and they decided in the case of Fiume to give it to, to the Slavs. Then there was a rebellion. You probably heard of Gabriele D'Annunzio, who was a poet, an Italian, and he organized a um, military expedition and he uh, uh, occupied the town for, for a certain period. And then it was given to, after the war, after 45, to Yugoslavia, to the Slavs. Now, this is one side. I think this is decided because uh, you cannot change uh, these assets anymore as it has been done in after, the, in after two wars. The second thing, but is I think what, what you meant before, is the growing difference between the, from the cultural point of view and the political po point of view of uh, urban and, and, and popular, let's say, of an urban and the popular part of the of strata of the population. And this you see in nearly all elections. No? Uh, particular interesting was the outcome of the regional elections in Germany now in, in, in Saxony and in Brandenburg, where you had an, a, a tremendous victory of the uh, uh, so-called populist uh, Alternative für Deutschland, and enormous losses for the uh, political parties. And the outcome is, or was, that uh, the voters voted much more to the right than ever, uh, and they will get governments much more on the left than ever because they are all getting together and form an anti-AFD coalition which continues to make the things even worse. The question is, is, is how long this uh, can continue uh, because uh, the people want to have uh, um, answers on questions like mass migration, um, centralization, uh, <clears throat> loss of incentives, whatever. I mean, uh, how long can it last, and how can how long can it last to inure the the the, uh, the democratic will of the people? I have two questions for the Austrians. Uh, you can you can pick which one you want to answer. Uh, one of them was, was the, the map of the, Austri uh, the Hungarian Empire, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Um, what was interesting, all these pockets of different languages, especially uh, Hungarians in, in Romania, and especially Germans all over. Uh, what, has what has happened to them? I mean, I, I traveled to, uh, to Romania a couple of years ago, and there is definitely still a lot of that that culture and all that there. Is there a movement or a, what, what's happening to those minorities? And the other one is um, the political mess you've had and the entertainment with, <laughs> with your political developments in Austria lately. Is there any hope, hopeful signs in that? So uh, I respond to your second uh, part of the question. Uh, he is the expert for the first part. So actually, um, I do not see any good solution which can occur in the next uh, future. We have uh, elections in two weeks, as you know. And um, there is a good chance that the former um, chancellor will be the next chancellor. So this young man called Sebastian Kurz. But uh, he, through the... Uh, so-called right-wing uh, Freiheitliche Partei out of the, of the government, and I do not see a realistic chance to get that again, despite the fact that the majority of the Austrians, or a relative majority of the Austrians, prefer this kind of, uh, of, of a coalition between the Freiheitliche and the ÖVP. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the feelings of um, of, of, of the really strong forces in the ÖVP are great co coalitioners. So they really want to have again a coalition, coalition with the Social Democrats, which they had for 30 years. And this was not good for the country, in my opinion. But I do not really see a realistic chance to have a second uh, Auflage, um, second, second stage of a, of a coalition between the Freiheitlichen and, and, and the ÖVP. So in the, in the short, short run, I do not see any, any light on the end of the tunnel. Um, regarding the national minorities in the East, well, there were different tactics after the First World War. The main problem was that the, with the dissolution of the... With, with the it's okay now? Okay. 
Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, after the, diso the dissolution of the dual monarchy, didn't change the pattern, the demographic pattern of the of, of, of the territories there. So there were still Germans living there. There were still uh, Romanians in Hungary and whatever, or, in, or, or uh, Hungarians in Romania. Uh, and uh, uh, there were some changes after the first war. That means. Uh, uh, people working for the for the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy from the centralized government had to leave Slovenia, for instance, partly also the Czech Republic. But most of all, the the, the structures, the the demographic, the, the minorities uh, map remained as it was under the dual monarchy. That changed after the Second World War because after the Second World War, and after the atrocities committed by the Germans and by the Nazis there. Uh, there was this uh, the ethnic cleansing with uh, brought about to th uh, 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 twelve to thirteen million people from Germans from the eastern part of Europe to Germany and to Austria. But there were still, and Romania is a good example. There were still minorities could, who, who could remain in Romania because Romania was never as anti-German as, for instance, the Czech Republic of Poland. No? So they were rather accepted there. And they remained. And then they became an object of business under Ceausescu. So Ceausescu, the communist dictator of Romania, literally sold the German minority to Germany. The Germans had to pay uh, I think something about uh, uh, not uh, not uh, uh, much money, but but not. Uh, I think about fifty thousand marks or for for a person. Yeah, and they went to Germany, and then he sold the Jews uh, to Israel. No? So uh, the last kind of ethnic cleansing was done in a. Uh, capitalist way in the sense that uh, you treat people like the property of a dictator. Yeah.